how it all ends, God wants us to know. He, through the ministry of Christ, told us that after this manner, we're supposed to be praying. And prayer is the only thing in the spiritual world we're supposed to endlessly do. All the other things, you know, you, you only eat meals at certain times, so you just can't read the Bible all the time. And, you know, and you share the gospel as the Lord opens the doors. But the one thing that is like breathing, it's kind of being on the brain telling us just to do it all the time, whether we're thinking it or not, is to pray without ceasing. And the component that's fascinating in that prayer is to constantly be asking for God's kingdom to come. And so that we can even pray that with the Ukraine. Did you know God is orchestrating what's going on with, with Russia and the Ukraine and everything else, the mess, to bring his kingdom in? So we're just, we're praying that. Then Jesus kind of explained to us what's coming, that it's going to be a, a, a bunch of normal things that are going to go from being normal to being abnormally arresting the attention of the world, those birth pains. And then... It's illustrated in the book of Revelation. Now we've come to our last one, God's kingdom. That we're praying for to come, we're supposed to be living it, that, that, it's, that God is reigning in our lives today. See, we're supposed to be the people in the world that aren't falling apart. You know, if you find someone uh, whose Bible is falling apart, most likely they're not, uh, because they are, are tuned in to what God's doing. And God wants us tuned in to what he's doing so that our lives are anchored by his word. So what we saw is the whole book of Revelation builds this out. God wants us to see Jesus clearly each day as our creator. Why? Because we're going through the most difficult time in history. And, and as we get closer and closer to the final time, Satan's power... Uh, it's almost like the Lord's plan is to pull back the control rods. That's part of what the rapture is. Uh, we had an atomic plant engineer here. I remember talking to him. I don't know where he's sitting, but, but he worked in atomic power around Chicago. And, you know, when you pull those graphite rods or whatever they're made of these days out, the, the neutrons or whatever, the, I'm not atomic, but when you pull it out, it really starts acting up and producing more and more energy. God is going to pull out the control rods of the church so that Satan dominates and, and everyone wants to worship him. It's unbelievable. And so for us, seeing that coming, it can be a little unsettling. So our creator, who he reveals himself with all these names and the I am's and everything we've been talking about, wants us to feel comforted. God doesn't think, hey, just, you know, uh, pull in all of your, you know, strength and just, just, Go through this. No, I want to comfort you. I want to walk through it. I want to care you. I want to help you. So we started there. Then we saw God wants us to see Jesus with us all our days on earth. And it's not just the, oh, great, he's with me. He's my redeemer. He bought and paid for me. I am not my own anymore. I was bought at a price. Therefore, I have to glorify him. And he's the coach. And that means he can pull me out of the game, put me in the game. He can stand up and say, stop that, or he can whatever. You know what I mean? We have to see Jesus as a lot more actively involved in the events of our life, and especially the, the part we're going to look at today will illustrate that. But finally, Revelation, the ending of it, 4 to 22, is God wanting us to see Christ's kingdom in the context of what the impact is on us. He is our judge and he is the one that's going to reward us for how we fulfill our part on the team that he has designed us to do, that he has empowered us to do. And someday, remember I talked about Burger King, about message one or two, about how they put the patties and they go across the flame on that little uh, conveyor belt. And at the other end, you know, they make your Whopper the way you want it. The real thing, if you ever see Burger King's flame, you know, cooking, think about your life going across there and whatever makes it through the fire, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, the fire that burns away anything we did that was not done for the glory of God. Remember Jesus already said, if you blow the trumpet when you give, you've lost the reward. That one burned up. He said that, that if you uh, do it for anything other than his glory, it gets burned up. But everything we do in life, only to be seen by God and done in the power of the Holy Spirit, makes it through the fire. 
Now, no sin is on there. Remember, it's already gone, and it's erased, and there's no record that we've sinned. That's why we're saints. But everything we do is either good for eternity or good for nothing, and it burns up. And that's what he wants us to think about, especially as we see the whole world uh, burning up. Now, where we ended last night, where we're going to begin and, and finish from this morning, God has a wonderful plan to conquer parts of this world for his glory. We, we heard about it through Rich. I mean, even a 19-year-old that's going to go back into the, the fray. I mean, what's really awful, I didn't know when I read that that it was a young lady. I was thinking of a young man. What the British news, you know, our American news is so sanitized. They hardly tell what's going on. But you read the London news, and it says those Russian soldiers that have been hanging around now for 12 days are getting a little antsy, and they've started going to village after village, driving their tank in and rounding up a few ladies, and they're starting to do massive raping across Ukraine. And so, I mean, it's not anywhere you'd want your daughter staying behind. And so that's even another way to think of the, the price people pay that are in this occupied country. But in a very similarly grossly immoral place, Christ planted the greatest church right there in the shadow of Satan's temple, that temple of Diana. And to have even a little church there was really a miracle. It'd be like planting a church during Mardi Gras or the Carnival down in, in Brazil or, you know, on, in, in the worst part of Los Angeles. Just, just think. Or maybe, you know, in Provincetown where the original gay community was uh, in Massachusetts. But whatever, think of planting not just a church, but the most powerful, greatest achieving church. And what we saw was, Jesus said, I have something against you. You no longer uh, give me first place in your life. Your heart no longer belongs solely to him. Their spiritual arteries were clogged with other things, and they were getting in danger of a spiritual heart attack. So what does he say? Here we go. Chapter 2. Get in your Bible, and I want to show you what he says to do. Uh, instead of telling you about it, let's all look at it together. Chapter 2 and verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly. Remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. And, and boy, he whammos them with two times uh, saying repent. Not just once, twice. So Jesus maps the way back. See, that's what's so neat. Jesus doesn't say, you shouldn't do that. Jesus is the coach. He's not up there telling us that. He's standing beside us saying, I, there's a way out of this. Remember, repent, do again. Jesus always asks us to go back to the original settings because we all got saved the same way. The supernatural transformation, regeneration. I mean, the seven parts when I teach soteriology, the seven parts of salvation, you know, that we are redeemed and justified and sanctified and adopted. And, and the entire work of salvation, Jesus says, hey, just remember everything I've done. Repent. Have a change of mind that, that you no longer want to go your own way. You want to go back to my way, and then just start doing the basics. See, there's no mystery in the Christian life. We all know all of it. All of you know all of it. All of you know more than most people in the world. You have so many resources. You've had so much freedom to listen and go to church. I mean, wow, we have so much. And to whom much is given, what? Much will be required. So what do we do? Jesus already asked all of us to seek him first. That's Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his rule, his kingdom, his righteousness. And then we're supposed to, Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone. We don't live from meal to meal. We live by every word of God. Every word of God. That's why Chris saw I brought my little notebook. I hope that, that all of you will consider beginning for the rest of your life a pursuit of getting to know personally every chapter of the Bible. There are only 1,189. You can do one every day. That means you can get done in less than four years, and you can personally have titled. You can just consider yourself a, a, you know, a Bible Institute. Uh, you Probably all of you that are grads have already had to do this, but you ought to then dust it off and redo it and remind yourself of 
every word of God that it says in Matthew 4, 4. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's what the Lord uses. He uses every part of the Bible in different ways. And, and when we study it, it gets put into this incredible computer he designed at the top of our bodies that he can spontaneously remind us of stuff we've previously learned. And you go, wow, I can't believe I remembered that. And it's, it's not that you're going to remember, you know, now you're going to remember every, key, you know, every login and everything. It's a spiritual gift for spiritual truth that the Lord brings at the appropriate moment so you can use it for him. And we're supposed to, Colossians 3, set our affections and things above. What I wrote is, now Jesus asks us to reset. Now, how many of you have ever seen one of those cable television uh, dishes that people connect to their homes? Have you ever seen those? Dish antennas? You know what I mean. If you travel internationally, every international apartment has one of those. I mean, only they're called Skynet or whatever. But have you ever seen those, right? You know what I mean. Dish antennas. Okay, now watch. This is my dish. This is my parabolic dish. And, you know, they look for these geosynchronous uh, satellites that are at 22,000 miles out. You know, there are three big ones. Or maybe they're doing Elon Musk, those uh, micro satellites that are up close. But wherever they are, they have computed in this location, that's the best place that you can get the signal. And so usually someone comes out you know, and does all kinds of uh, calculations, and they put the post up, and they crank that dish, and they, they very carefully calibrate it and get it, and they check the signal till it's the strongest, and it's pointing this way. Now watch. So I've got, this is my dish antenna. So if you're driving down the road, and you see a dish antenna like this pointing up toward the sky, what can you figure? That someone is connected, and they're using that. Now, if you're driving by and you see the dish antenna like this, what's going on? Nothing. A prankster maybe knocked it down. Yeah, nothing's, no signal's coming in, but why would it be pointed down? Maybe there was a storm. Maybe they didn't tighten it enough. But instantly, if you saw the dish antenna pointing at the ground, you would know it needs to be, look at this, reset. Reset your dish antenna to stay pointed at him. The spiritual discipline or works we need to do again are always the same. Get back focused, tighten it down, open the line, start receiving the message, and start responding to it. You know what's amazing? If you could put on spiritual glasses and see where people's hearts are pointed, many of them, well, let's look, look at what, I'll read it to you. Look at Colossians 3.1. It says, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things above. Point your dish antenna on things above. What does verse 2 say? Not on things on the earth. You can tell immediately where someone's dish is pointed. If their entire life is consumed with this world, protecting what they have in this world, getting more of this world, enjoying more, and they're just desperately, they're trying to get it all in, this is where their dish is pointed. And that's why so many people, you know, the most confessed thing as a pastor of three decades that, that I experienced were people that said to me, I just don't have time for the word. That long prayer, I don't have time for memorizing verses. I don't, have, I don't have enough time for that. That instantly tells me where their antenna is pointed. What the Lord says is, ah, it's always the same, point the right direction. Jesus asks us, just like in any marriage or relationship, it's all about time and focus and trust. You want to have a close relationship with someone? Spend time with them, focus on them, and come to the point where there is immense trust. Okay? Do we invest our prime time with Jesus? What is it that, that as soon as you're, you know, your coffee is kicked in or you've washed your face and, and your eyes are, are, 
you know, working. What's the first thing you can't wait to get to? That tells us, that tells you where your antennas point to. Jesus says, I want your prime time. Now, I have a challenge. My wife is like a college student. She comes alive at about 9.30 at night. Me, I've already, you know, been shuffling around the robe on it about 8.30, you know. She's just coming alive. When we travel to these Bible institutes, you know who, who loves, uh, which of the team members they love? It's Bonnie. She's in the dorms with the girls. I mean, they're talking, and she's everywhere around me. I'm just, I mean, if I have to do the evening dorm chapel, I'm, I'm saying, guys, I'm going to finish this while I'm still awake, but I'm going to bed right after, so, you know, ask your questions quick. Bonnie comes alive at night. I mean, she, she's best from like 9.30 to 1 or 2 in the morning. Oh, my, me? Gone at 8.30. Oh, up at 5, 5.30, right? You know, but there are two kinds of people. Some people are like that, uh, the springers and the feelers. You know, the people that spring out of bed in the dark and they're just going, and those that go like this, you know, and it takes them a couple hours to get really moving. That doesn't mean we're all supposed to read the Bible at 5.30. Our prime time. Your prime time might be at night. It could be whatever you study and, and you're doing all of your chapter things. You do it just before you go to bed and that's all you think about all night long. Boy, that's great. Others, it's the first thing. I mean, we've got to get up in the dark and do it. And, but it doesn't matter. It's our prime time that, we, that Jesus knows we're focusing on him. And then we focus on him intently looking right at him. If you're talking to someone and, and, and they're really listening to you, they're looking right at you. I mean, and they're just trying to look at your face and your eyes and, and your mouth, and they're listening to the words, and they don't want to miss anything. You all know when, when you're talking to someone and you can hear something else going on, especially if you're on the phone, you hear them, you know, they're typing. They've got to get one of those silent keyboards, or you know they're doing it. Or, you know, that, that you can tell by the lags that they're actually looking at something. Maybe they're watching, maybe they're playing a game. Who knows what they're doing, but they're certainly not focused on you. You know what Jesus says? I want you to focus on me. I want you to look right at me. He wants our prayer, our reading his word, our memory work, our sacrificial giving, everything to stay prompted by consuming love. Now, I want to tell you real quick. In fact, I, I won't finish if I don't read this. In 1983, I led a mission exposure trip. I, was, uh, I just finished up eight years at Bob Jones University. Uh, I'd gotten a BS and a BA and an MA and a... Uh, uh, MDiv, and I was working on my PhD, and I mean, I was, all those years I was in school. But at the end, over that summer, I led a mission exposure trip, and I got to teach in churches. Uh, I mean, it was exciting. I was in Eastern Europe, I was in Western Europe, I, we went to Africa, I went to uh, Asia. It was a 96-day missions trip. Bonnie and I right now, are on uh, day five of 72 days. So we have 67 more days till we get back to our home base in Colorado. And so, but this was a 96-dayer in 1983. Now think of this. Right up, it ended, this missionary trip, two weeks before I was to marry Bonnie. She was in Syracuse, New York. I went to 30 countries on three continents for 96 days, okay? So that, I hope that gives you a little backdrop. Every day when I would get to the desk of the mission we were staying at or the hostel or the hotel or the YMCA, I would ask, I would run because uh, 1986 or 1983, I was 27 years old and I still could run and I would run to the desk and say, is there a letter for me? Because Bonnie, way back before I left in September, we were getting married December 27th, on September 6th when we left, she had already for over a month had exactly our schedule, all the places. I mean, I was teaching at the Taj Mahal in northern India, and I was in the jungles of Thailand, and we were in China running up the rivers doing stuff, and we were all over in Africa. I mean, she, in the UK, speaking between all these churches, and we flew between all of them. We had one of those tickets, TWA, before they went bankrupt, or whatever they did, had a ticket that you could stop as many times as you wanted as long as you were always going either east or west. And they had a partner, so I took Air India and Transworld Airlines. And between the two, I would fly 
Boston to London, London down into Africa, up into Germany, back down into Africa, up into Scandinavia. I was always going east. And it was really, really neat. But Bonnie was in Syracuse, and every flight was going away, further away from her, until we got, you know, halfway around, then we started getting closer. But I would say, is there a note for me? And then I would sit down, sinking to the floor right there and then, if they had one. I would hold that precious record of Bonnie's voice. As I read, I could hear her. I could see her smile. I could feel her close. And everybody on that team that was with me for 96 days knew that they couldn't try and disturb me because it wouldn't work. I was undisturbable until I finished reading, hearing her voice. And I would sit there, and nothing could separate me from her love. Until the next day's letter, I would treasure all of my letters. I carried them with me. I have a, I have a binder with all those letters she sent me for those 96 days, all in order, on that thin onion skin, if you remember, paper. There's still a treasure I would ponder every word in my mind, and I couldn't wait for the next one. And if none came the next day, I just read my old ones, just like they had arrived. Is that how you look at the scriptures? Or, I've already read that. I'm going to go to the Christian bookstore and find a new book on some, something new, but I've already read that. See, it's whether or not we're prompted by a consuming love. It's not, I have to do this. It's not, I've got to check off the box. It's not that, that someone might ask me if I'm doing my, my quiet time. No. That's, that's not what the Lord designed. That's the mechanism that, that we in America, we're so mechanical. We want progress, and we just want to check it off and have done it. We've lost that consuming love that prompts it. You know what it says in John 14, 21? He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me will be loved to my Father, and I will love him, Jesus said, and we will manifest ourselves to him. When I think of how my wife-to-be had a letter for me at every one of those 30 countries, some of them were even communist countries that we ministered in, mainland China, I mean, all over Asia. And I don't know how. She calculated at the post office and found out that it takes 76 days for a letter to get from here to here. And she just was a continuous letter writing, uh, you know, envelope licking, uh, stamp putting, label making communicator with me. And it gave me the most beautiful picture of how, for the rest of my life, I should look on God's word. That's what the Lord was asking. And if you belong to Jesus, then he wants us to know that everything we do, everything we think, everything we say, that means the way we approach his word, the the reason that we study his word is either pleasing to him or not. Doesn't that make life simple? Whether, therefore, you eat, it either pleases me or not, or drink, it either pleases me or not, or whatever you do, either pleases me or not. Did you know that's, that's why the early church had it so simple? They didn't complicate life. They, there were not rivalries. I mean, well, yeah, there were. I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas. But they didn't have these rivaling voices. They were, they were originating from their time in the Word where Jesus said, I, I want you to be a well-done, good and faithful servant. I want you to please me. And they caught it. And they did it. And they were prompted by love. So this morning, where you're going after this either pleases the Lord or not. Now, if there's someone you want to impress, if, you're, if, if you love them, if you want to get close to them, you don't intentionally do things that displease them because that repels them. And so, see, that's why Jesus compared our marriage to our relationship to him. And he said, Husbands, well, that's why I've performed 300 wedding ceremonies, and I love wedding ceremonies. I always like to get them up in front, and I say, welcome to the second greatest day in this couple's life. That gets the whole group whispering, is this a remarriage? 
second greatest day? I go, and the first and greatest day was the day they came to know Jesus Christ. Then I answer it. I share their testimonies, and I look at the guy who's scared and, you know, usually a little clammy and, you know, hyperventilating, and I say, this young man has agreed to take on the role of portraying Jesus Christ for the rest of his life. His wife has taken on the role of reflecting the adoration and admiration of a church to their Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this woman is agreeing to become this man's very best friend in the whole world, closer to him than to her mother, her sisters, or her future children, and all of her other buddies in life. He is going to be her very best friend. Isn't that what the church is supposed to be? Yet I remember the first time I taught that from the book of Titus, because that's actually a verse in the Bible. It says that women are to be the uh, phil andras, is the Greek word. Phil means phileo, that's the love of friendship. Andras is the word for husband. They're supposed to be husband friends. By the way, that's the very first command of a Titus II woman, to become that's, uh, there are two groups, and the older women are supposed to already be that. The younger women, their very first command of the list that Paul gave them is to be husband friends. Your husband is to become the closest friend you have on earth. I remember teaching that. A group of people at Calvary Bible Church went to the elders and said, if he harps on that anymore, we're not coming. Because they were closer to their mother, they were closer to their sisters, and they were closer to their children and all the girlfriends they had than their husbands. And they wondered why their husbands were passive and distant. Men are responders. And they, it's irresistible to them whoever pays attention to them. And if the lady at the office pays more attention to them than their wife, it's a real dilemma for them because they gradually relocate their, their satellite dish toward where the attention is coming from. And so that's why Paul said the first thing you do in the church is you engage an army of godly older women to teach those younger women that their first priority is to make their husband the closest earthly friend as Christ is to be to us. So I wonder... Are our marriages pleasing Christ or not? Does your husband feel that you admire him as much as Christ? It's a real motivator to men. It scares them to death when they're finally allowed to play their role. Most of them don't. Uh, Jesus knows our loves and hates. Look at Revelation 2.6. Look at this. Have you ever thought about that? What Jesus actually knows about our lives? Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. He says, this I have for you. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I hate it too. Have you ever thought Jesus knows what we love, what we hate, and whether we hate the same thing he hates? Do you know what Jesus hates? Do you hate what Jesus hates? See, that's part of this whole close relationship. For Bonnie, I became a lifelong student of her. I had this, this notebook, and from our very first date on May 1st, 1983, we started... I met her on May 1st, 1983. We were engaged on July 4th, 1983. Then I left on that incredible 96-day trip, and we were married on December 27th. I had a short time to find everything out I could about her, and I wrote down, if she said, I like butter pecan, boy, that went in the book. If she says, you know, I like fried whatever, I, that went in the book. And she said, I've always wanted to. If I heard her say in conversation to anybody else, I've always wanted to, I was eavesdropping. It was a... Wow, that was an exciting insight into her life. That's what our Bible study is like. And if we find out Jesus hates something, we hate it. Now look at verse 7. Remember, we're at the coffee shop, and we're studying this out loud, and we're applying it. And what we're doing is, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And by the way, that ending is on all seven of these letters. And this ending is about who's really saved. The evidence of salvation is right there in verse 7. He who has an ear. What did Jesus say when he was walking around the Temple Mount, the, the colonnade of Solomon, when he gave the good shepherd John chapter 10 message? Do you remember what he said? My sheep 
hear my voice. So what John is capturing in this letter from Jesus is that true believers hear the voice of Christ. Uh, let's turn there. I know you all know that. But look at John chapter 10. It's, it's phenomenal to think how simple salvation is. It gets so confusing nowadays. People argue about who's saved, who's not saved, how do they get saved, did they pray the right prayer, did they do it the right way, you know, what happened? Look what Jesus, how simply he said it. Verse 26 of chapter 10 of John, but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. <laughs> Everything was simple with Jesus. You either were or weren't. We, we have this huge middle ground where we're not sure about anything. Jesus was quite confident, quite bold, and in him, with his word, we can also be very bold and very confident of what he says. But it takes a lot of work to, to get down to what he says because we have to work through all this stuff that we're not sure. You know, a lot of people aren't sure if Ben Franklin said it or God said it. You know what I mean? Because, you know, they don't have enough time. You know, you remember, uh, what is it? Cleanliness is next to godliness. All these things that people in the world think that, that are quotations from the Bible. Jesus said, you're not one of my sheep. Who are your sheep? Verse 27 of chapter 10 of John. My sheep are the ones that hear my voice. They're the ones I know. What did Jesus say? And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, even Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Salvation is knowing a person. It's not praying a prayer. It's not going forward. I know people have gone forward a thousand times and prayed more than that. And, and if you talk to them, you say, uh huh, and how are you say, well, like someone, I just shared the gospel with, because we're always supposed to be doing that with someone. And they said, oh, I did that. I said, you did that. I said, great. What did God do? Did God give you a new heart, a new spirit? Did God take away your stony heart out of you? Did he put a soft heart in? Does God cause you to keep his word? I just quoted for you Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, which is the new covenant, which is the new birth, which is what is salvation. See, truly born-again people respond to Christ when they hear his voice. That's why he's walking around to see whether or not we're, we're turning on the recording. See, when you open the Bible, it's not to have to do something. It's to hear him speak, hear him. His sheep hear his voice. It's not just they hear it at salvation. They hear it every day. It's the greatest reminder of who we are and who we belong to and why we're here because we hear him when we read his word. Now, it says in Psalm 119, verse 18, you know, Ezra's prayer before he ever studied the Bible, he says, open my eyes, I might behold wonderful things out of your word. So he did start, like George Mueller, my hero, said he always bowed and asked the Lord to open his word, and then he, he listened. But he listened to the word of God. He heard his voice. Well, it's God's spirit within us that empowers our response, and we, by faith, want to respond that's what genuine salvation is. It's not I did that. It's God did that. And, and he began a good work in me. I received the engrafted word that his word talks about. I received a person that now lives within me, and I hear their voice when I read the word. It's, it's the most exciting thing in the world to experience this. Oh, it's 1025. Can you believe it? I'll tell you a quick one. Uh, Bonnie and I uh, heard from someone from uh, YouTube, and it was a 60-ish year old woman. She was riding London subway, and she was kind of at the end of herself. She, she told me the whole story. She said, I was a groupie. I went to every rock concert. You know, you know all the rock famous ones or the British ones, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and queen and i mean i don't i i don't know anything about music but i mean they're the famous ones you see the movies about them she went to all of them and she's about our age and so i i started thinking about all the ones i'd heard of and she said yes i went to every one of them and she says you go there as a single young lady and you just try and attract as many boys as you can so you have a place to sleep at night that's why you, you know you get the boys so you can go wherever he's staying you sleep with him and usually he shares the drugs with you and the alcohol with you. And she said, that was my life from a teenager 
until six months ago. And she said, every concert, whenever they had one, they're, you know, they're like every few months, she said, I lived for the concert, I planned my life around the concert, I rode the trains from London where I lived to the concert, and she said, I always came back with a record jacket, an album of whoever did the concert, and I would try and write on it the names of the, if I could remember how many boys I had slept with in my, in my dissipation and drunkenness and drugs and and going from tent to tent, I'd try to remember them. And she said, I had those on my London flat wall, her apartment. And she said, now I'm in my 60s. And she said, you know, it's kind of hard to attract, after uh, decades of that, it's hard to attract men to invite you into their tents, you know. And, but she said, I'm still going to the concerts and still doing all that. And she said, I was on my way home. And she said, I felt so empty. She said, I've felt empty for decades. So she said, I was thinking life was empty and worthless, and she said, I sat with my phone on the subway, and I typed into Google, video on hope. And she got the th three or four minute clip of the closing concert at Calvary Bible Church where they captured me talking about the season of hope and what Jesus... You know how at the end of the Christmas concert there's always that gospel, you know, hook right at the end because the community comes in twice a year, Easter and Christmas. And so it was Calvary's and, you know, we had multiple comfort concerts and thousands of people came. And so I, one of those times I was doing this gospel presentation from Luke 1, 78 and 79 about everybody's wow. born blind on the edge of the precipice. They're sitting there in their blindness and they're tumbling into the blackness of darkness forever. And, and, you know, that was 30 seconds. And then the next two and a half minutes, I talked about why Christ came, the sunrise from on high to open our eyes and turn us from darkness to light and all that. And she's sitting on the London subway. She's at minute 2.5. And I said, okay, I want all of you to bow your head right now. And she said she bowed her head on the subway. You know, that's how people are. They really get into their games and their movies. They're just doing whatever it says. So she bowed her head. And I says, right now, I says, Jesus is within an arm's length of every one of you. If you would like him, reach out toward him right now. And, and, and she was bowed her head, but she was looking at the video, and I was going like this. So she said on the subway, she went. And then I said, you know, you just ask him. You know, I just did the gospel that you all do. That's great. Of course, I didn't know about this. I was at the concert, and it was a couple years before she saw that. She wrote me a note and said this. She said, six months ago, I was sitting on the London tube watching you. And she said, you said bow your head, I bowed my head. You said reach out, I reached out. You said cry out, I cried out. She says, guess what? She said, I just came from the, the bin. That's what they call dumpsters, the bin you know, B-I-N. She said, I just came from the bin my last trip. She says, I have taken down every one of those albums. She said, they are disgusting to me. They are reminders of all my rebellion against God and, the, and, and my body is, a, you know, his temple. And she says, I threw them all away. She says, my whole life has changed. She said, I, I still have the same job. She said, I still have the same apartment. She said, I still have the same body that is less and less desirable to the men at those concerts. But she says, for the last six months, she says, my life has utterly changed. She said, I find myself, all I want to do when I get home from work is read God's word. She says, I've sought out a Christian assembly, and I'm a part of it. But she says, the more I thought about it, she said, it all started sitting on the subway with my eyes closed reaching out to God. Do you know what? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You know what the acid proof, the acid test of salvation is? Whether or not you heard his voice and you're following him today. See, when someone says, I did that, and yet there's, there is no no evidence that they are today hearing his voice and following him. There's cause for concern, okay? Because 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself whether you're in the faith. For how do you know except you yourself are a castaway? Only you know if you've heard his voice. 
by that, I don't mean, ooh, you know, the sound out here somewhere. I mean, when the Word of God speaks, you are receiving, your antenna picks up the signal and you say, I want to respond to you. That's what God is doing. That's genuine salvation. He speaks to all believers through all the ages. And he, I like this, verse 7. Verse 7. And all of them say the same thing, the ending of all these letters. Verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. Revelation 2, 7. See, we are overcomers. The people with ears, the people that respond to Christ, the people that follow him, the people that he has saved, that have been converted, that have been born again, you understand what I mean? All those terms we use are overcomers. That's what 1 John says. And Paul put it this way, he that began a good work in us, that lady, I always see her reaching out on the subway. He that began that good work doesn't leave us. He's going to finish it. I guess that's the most important message of Revelation. That we're not going this alone. We're not flailing around on our own. Right next to us, all the time, is the Creator who redeemed us, who someday we're going to stand in front of as the one sitting on that Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And he's asking us that he, he energized us for good works. He wants us to finish well with good works. He's going to keep us by the power of God. He says, are you letting me coach your life? And if we would have not run out of time, I would have talked about the near extinction of Christianity. Nero started murdering people. Domitian exiled John and did it. But there's the bad guy, Diocletian. And Diocletian systematically ravaged the church. He was the most amazing of all the Roman emperors. He's the only one that retired. <laughs> all the rest of them either died of dissipation or they were murdered or died on the battlefield. Not Diocletian. He said, I'm done. I don't want to be emperor anymore. And he went back to his palace that's in uh, Dubrovnik or wherever. It's down there in Croatia somewhere. The entire town is, is built inside his palace. It was so massive. He used his great engineering skills to systematically kill or imprison every pastor in the Roman Empire. That's all they were concerned with, to get rid of every pastor. They got rid of every meeting place. If any church was even rumored to meet somewhere, they razed the building. And he finally hunted down and destroyed every complete copy of the Bible. If you know anything about textual criticism and Greek manuscripts, there is no complete copy of the New Testament. By complete, I mean someone sat down or a group sat down and wrote it in one short time period and made it into a scroll or a collection of, of papyrus documents that is still in existence because he destroyed every one. But what the church did is, same thing they did when I used to smuggle Bibles, they would, in Russia, they would tear out each book of the Bible and disperse it among 66 families in the church. And if the KGB came, they could only get one of the 66 books because they had dispersed them. And that's what the early church did. That's why we have 25,000 manuscript copies of the New Testament because when they saw those legionnaires coming, they, they cut up the Bible into all the pieces and spread it out among all the people. And after Diocletian got done, they started gathering them back. And we have a whole Bible, Old and New Testament, but we have no single manuscript copy from before his time. He almost did it. That was the closest Christianity got to extinction. But God said, no. I'm going to coach them through even this. And he did. Well, only Jesus can identify with our struggles. He's our greatest sympathizer. And he told those who were facing fatal persecutions, I know what you're going through, and I'm going to go through it with you. That's the message of the book of Revelation. It's not about identifying whether Putin might be one of the whatevers. It really doesn't matter. That's God's department. My department is I'm supposed to be here worshiping my creator, knowing he redeemed me, doing what he left me to do, and not able to, to contain my excitement to someday stand in front of him when he says this is 
the summary of everything you lived for me, and I'm going to give it back to you, a little crown. And you can, can show your adoration for me by casting it before me. And I can't wait to give you your new name on that little invitation to heaven, that stone that's a little bit later in chapter 2. And I'm going to welcome you to a banquet, and I'm going to take you in front of my Father in heaven, and I'm going to confess the name that nobody else knows but you, and I'm going to introduce you to your Father and my Father, and you are going to spend forever with me in my house. Amen. That's what the early church lived for. Let's bow. Father, I pray that's what we would live for. I pray that we would look on our Bible study completely differently. That It's really a, a love letter from you as we're on this extended trip, and we can't wait to get to the wedding, and we can't wait to marry you. And you have sprinkled all along the way these love letters in your book, and we, we can't be distracted. It's not people can distract us. They can't because we're consumed by love for you. I pray that you would stir our hearts to that end. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said...